Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Maryam Namazi and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host Bahram Surush. Hello. And Fairyworth Puya. Hi. Before we start our program, we are obviously drinking wine um, as a way of breaking the rules and regulations during Ramadan. As you know, in many countries under Islamic rule, like in Iran, like in, um, and, and also countries like Morocco, Jordan, and, and Saudi Arabia, and many other places, there are huge penalties and fines, including flogging and imprisonment for eating or drinking during uh, Ramadan. And so in solidarity with all those people who dare to do what is basically quite a normal thing to do, we're having a, a glass of wine when we're not allowed and we to. We are actually breaking two laws, you know, <laughs> one against uh, the, uh, Ramadan and, and the other against alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. So. Okay. Got to break as many so, as you so can. Can I, just, can, I just say, can I just say my statistics? Because this, yes, is very go ahead. <laughs> this is very important because the consumption of food in Ramadan is more than normal times because people just eat and it's a very unhealthy thing to do in, <laughs> in so, case if anybody so, asks. So better to uh, eat and drink uh, just normally. Just normally, yeah. you know, you know just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this week's program is going to be about the role of women in the revolutions in Iran, the Middle East and North Africa. And we're going to be speaking with uh, Magdalene Abeda, who's a Libyan women's rights activist who was forced to flee the country as a result of her activities. Let's listen to a background clip on this issue and then we'll be back to discuss this matter further. Stay with us. Like other women in Iran and the region, Magdalena Beda and Salwa Bukhagis fought for a revolution which in Libya brought an end to Gaddafi's dictatorship. They carried on their fight for equal rights and freedom when faced with a transitional government that targeted women's rights. As a result of their activism, Magdalene was forced to flee after being threatened and kidnapped by Islamists while Salwa was brutally assassinated in late June. Despite the threats, women's rights campaigners like Magdalene continue to demand secularism and equality. One of the things um, you know, that I find really interesting about this issue is when we talk about you know, the, the fact that women are on the front lines of resistance, you often have people saying, well, why are you criticizing Islamic laws then? You know, if women can do everything, then what's the problem with that? And I think the, the fact is that they're doing it despite those laws and, in, in, you know, in resistance to it and in opposition to it. You can't credit those laws and the repression for the humanity um, and the, the you know, of, of resistance and the women's liberation movement. Okay, there are no, no protections uh, for women. So if there is, um, and whatever laws there are, usually in those sort of countries like Libya in Iran, um, they are built in to discrimi discriminate against women. So if you are discriminated against, you can't go f uh, for protection of laws. You can't seek redress in that way. And whatever there is uh, in, in terms of um, uh, working against those rules is down to the women. You know, the women protesters. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's interesting. I, I remember when uh, during the Khatami's um, government, um, people would visit Iran and say, look, look, there's so many young women in universities and they credit the Islamic regime. Actually, the women being gate-crashing universities, despite the Islamic regime and restrictions, in the same way today that they're trying to gate-crash a stadium, stadium and the sports facilities to go in and participate as the spectators and, and participants, which the, actually the Islamic regime is trying to prevent them. But if, when people gate-crash and go in, do not credit the Islamic regime, actually, is despite the Islamic regime, as you said, Maria. I think one of the things is that people are somehow, when it comes to, you know, our countries in the South and the Third World, they basically, uh, there's a lot of um, th this idea that these are homogeneous societies and very often that the state actually represents people. They can't see, you know, the vast political and social movements, the class politics that are taking place day in and day out, and the immense resistance. I think that's why very often there's this confusion. If you can look at it that way, then it becomes very easy to distinguish between those who are being oppressed and resisting and those who are oppressing. Yeah, Im imagine for a moment that the BNP or EDL rule in, in Britain, and you credit those sort of right-wing uh, groups and governments 
for the uh, uh, you know women's right that exists in current you know in, in Britain. You can't credit you know the right wing groups, and exactly the same in Iran. In the same way that there are class and you know class differences, there are women activists. In the same as in Iran, you know these daily fight is a very dynamic society, and people fighting for a better uh, society. And actually, there's an important date, and, and that's the um, 20th of June 2009, because uh, I think that changed quite a lot the perceptions about Iran. If you're talking about Iran. I remember, I mean, I'm sure you guys remember as well, before 2009, how hard it was say, to, have, to try to convince the Western audience that in Iran there's a complete separation between the people and the government. You know? The people are not following the government, and the Islamic Republic is not a representative of the people. And the people in 2009 came out on the streets and said that you know, in, in their millions. And that made, uh, change, that was a sort of sea change actually. And it made working, you know, campaign uh, work much easier in, in, in that sense. So, and, and, and the Arab revolutions as well, as, that yeah. changed the perception as well. And uh, so those point to really deep down realities, you know, they are not very strange, isolated, you know, colonial colonies that they are very separate, very homogeneous, you know, that there are no classes, as you say, that you know, that everybody follows the one tribe and things like that. I mean, I, the, th the thing too is that it's also a result of social media. I mean, we've talked about this Absolutely. before, is the fact that people are not able to show their protests in ways that very often it used to be censored by the big mainstream media, you know, and, and very often you can hear about it. Now you hear about every little thing and every little protest that goes on, and you can just see how vast it really is. Let's talk a bit, I mean, for another minute or two before we go to the video on the fact that we often talk about how the revolution in Iran in particular, I think Iran is quite key, uh, it will be a female revolution and how that's going to have a huge effect across the globe. I mean, just, just to reiterate, when the Islamic regime suppressed the rev revolution in 1979 revolution and came to power on the back, it, what, it, what seemed like on the back of a popular revolution, it really helped to in the exportation of uh, Islamism across the globe. And in a sense, a lot of people are now looking to Iran and the, the progressive, secular, modern movement there, the women's liberation movement there, as being a turning point in actually you know, pushing down uh, Islamism and, in uh, Iran and elsewhere. And, and that's, the, that's the solution to the situation that exists in Iran and Middle East. Can I just say that the same sort of forces operate in North Africa, and in Middle East, as well as Iran. The difference is that the, it, it's been articulated in Iranian society as very clearly represented thanks to you know people like yourself Maniam and a huge vast uh, you know movement that exists and people can artic articulate that that movement and I think in North Africa in Egypt you'll see that in uh, in other Middle Eastern countries the same sort of movement exists and I think you, you, we'll see that yeah I, I mean I think there's a couple of other factors too in addition to what you're saying one is of course the fact that the 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 the, the background of a revolution I mean we've had a longer time from our revolution. Mm -hmm. in, in many uh, North Amer African and uh, Middle Eastern countries, it's newer. Uh, we've had a long history of resisting this movement, but also I think it's the fact that we have a strong left in Iran, you know, a sort of um, uh, uh, a political and social movement that is representing the left and these sort of human ideals that has made it part, a very, a very social, um, you know, a matter for for, peop for for the general population. And despite 35 years of the Islamic regime, it's, it's still undefeated sort of movement. And yes. that, that's the yeah. characteristics of this movement. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, even in 1979, uh, Iranian society was very cosmopolitan, uh, very culturally, very Western oriented. So the Islamism had very little chance. Uh, and I think we, in, our pro in our other programs, we have talked about how the equations at that time about Cold War allowed the Islamism you know, to gain a foothold in that region. Uh, and as you say, the revolution itself, I think, uh, provided a, a situation for the, uh, for the left and the, for the radical critique of you know, uh, social cr criticism to develop. And uh, as you say, uh, if the Arab revolutions happened in 2011, the revolution in Iran happened in 1979. Yeah? So that was one, uh, one in a series of revolutions which have continued. So in that sense, the resistance and the struggle against the regime has never um, stopped. And, and, and uh, there's always this confrontation going on. 
And what we are witnessing, I think, is this uh, sort of anti-Islamic backlash. That's why people, outsiders, they say, okay, if there is a hope somewhere it's Iran. You know, in, in, in the Middle yes. East, it, it will be Iran, it's like a renaissance, you know, and, and that could be the trigger for a different kind of Middle East. I, I'll have to stop you there because we're actually going over the discussion and the program's going to end up being more than 30 minutes. We'll come back to you five words. Let's just first listen to a clip of an interview we did earlier with the wonderful Magdalene Abuda. Stay with us. pleasure to have you on our program. I'm really sorry to hear that one of uh, the women's rights campaigners you were working with was killed recently by Islamists. Tell us about her and um, how you must be feeling. You know, uh, until this moment, I re don't really believe that she was killed. And, and it's, it's really a tra tragic, it's really sad news. Um, it, she's a flame and just she died because because of her views, because of her uh, support of human rights. She's a human rights lawyer. She's really great woman. That's it's a big loss for Libya, and and uh, she was killed, uh, you know, 25th of June, and and it was it was really um, a big news for us. And how, how did news. they kill her? What did they do? Well, uh, they entered her house. The Islamists. Yes. Uh, there's different stories in Il now, but the, the story, they say that they tried to stab her, and she, when she defended herself, she was shot dead. And her husband was kidnapped until now he's missing. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's really bad, and I really feel bad because this woman is she could she could really do so much change if she was in the right place in in Libya although she tried her best and she she did she did change of course but it, to lose such a people that working really for for the gov for the for the um, for the country and they really believe in the country and they want uh, uh, they want to implement a good life for 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 this generation and the generation coming, and and it's really bad. I mean, the thing is, uh, you yourself have uh, been uh, kidnapped and threatened, uh, beaten by Islamists for women's rights work. Tell us what happened there, and in a sense, this could have been you had you not fled the country. Of course, I think I was so lucky not to be, not to be killed basically, because I was kidnapped for three days and I could really get killed because I told that I never go out of that alive. And, and it, the threat has started since we start working for women's rights, when we saw that women's rights is really going down and laws start to change and speaking about women's clothes, uh, about guardians if you want to travel, about marrying a second wife without even the agreement of a first wife. It's just putting the woman as a subject. She's not really a human being. You don't really discuss with her. And she, you can do whatever you want. It's, she's basically, she's nothing. And that's why we start going out in the street demonstrating against these behaviors. And we had all these threats and some of the women you know, to, uh, lost their jobs for because their photos were everywhere, and they were calling them very nasty um, words. Do uh, is it? It's you know, it's it's the 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 Islamists and their militias when they come into power, they always attack women first, don't they? I mean, with the laws that you mentioned, and also they they feel so threatened by women's rights yeah. campaigners like yourself. Yeah, because women can do a lot of a change. Allowed women can do so much change because this is the first threat for them, and that's why they want to put this voice down. You don't. Uh, I don't think that you see a lot of uh, men that fighting for human rights and fighting for for uh, women rights because no one feels how 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 
how the women are suffering, except uh, like the women themselves, because they are threatened, their rights are threatened, and so that they they feel the injustice so much more than men, and they that's why they, you find them fighting for the human rights, fighting for equality, fighting for better life. You started a, an organization called Happy My Rights. Yeah. Um, and what what was the role of that organization? What were you trying to achieve? We were trying to achieve uh, um, equality for women's rights, especially in the constitution, because our target was laws, because as long as the laws are uh, protected, you can argue other things. But if you have problem in the law for women's rights, it's, it's done. You can't really, it's really hard to change. And so we tr we're trying to um, create a group of youth to fight for uh, women's rights and advocate going to schools, giving lectures, and then we had project working for um, women's rights in the constitution, but uh, of course it wasn't successful because um, I was the president of the organization and I had to leave the country. And other or or international organization, they didn't want to deal with us because of our um, our uh, the problems that we had uh, because of me I was kidnapped and and they didn't really want to have a problem especially in the society because they were calling us uh, spies um, uh, uh, seculars as if it's a crime and and also destroying Islamic morals so we couldn't really have any funding anymore because international um, international uh, uh, organizations refuse to work with us. What do you think about uh, Islamic feminists, like there's a uh, Voice of Libyan Women organization where they try to combine Islam and, and uh, women's rights? Uh, this is a, a combination that could never happen because if you talk about women's rights, it's you talk about rights and equality, which is not available in any religion. I mean, if you, if like this kind of organization, like Islamic organization that's speaking about human women rights in, in by the name of God or by the name of uh, religion, it's, I don't consider them uh, women rights organizations or even a human rights organization because they are working against women rights. You gave me, you, you were telling me an interesting story about how you uh, and a group of secular women went to support, um, you know, the woman who was uh, running this group yeah. and you went to one of their meetings because you said, well, let's try and support women's yeah. rights campaigners. Tell us what happened at that meeting. Yes, basically we tried to do this because, you know, our reputation in the society, we are secular women and not covered and so on. We said, okay, if our target is women's rights, so it doesn't matter for us, uh, she's a cover or not it's not it's just by coincidence because we are a secular organization so all most of women that coming are not covered so we said the best thing to do is we uh, support another um, uh, women rights organization that's uh, a bit uh, traditional with religion and so on so we went to their uh, you know their uh, lecture and they were giving lecture to uh, to children in the school and uh, and we were just standing just our you know standing there to give support and our presidents uh, prisons and she was one of the children she asked this uh, the girl uh, the um, the leader of the voice of Libyan women she said uh, will my brother uh, be beats me up at home and I think he have the right to do so because for example I didn't prepare lunch for him and and they always they always you know uh, beat them up if they did something wrong if they have even a Facebook account and she said you know in Islam it's not uh, it's not that you beat the women hardly you know you can beat the women like a little bit just to show her that what she's done was wrong <laughs> and I was like oh my god and I was looking my friend was standing in front uh, beside me and I said I think we should go <laughs> if I don't really want to be part of such a thing I don't want to be part of uh, beating women is something okay to do. We don't. This is not our strategy, and this is not what we are going to support. 
You, you mentioned this very woman has actually met with Hillary Clinton and she's received awards and, and things like that. Was that yes, the same one? Yes, that's true. So uh, it, it's interesting how you do find a lot more support for Islamic feminists and less for secular women, yes. though secularism is so key for any of our societies. Yes. This is a mystery that I can't understand, to be honest, because not only uh, in Libya, even like in Yemen, for example, Tawakkul Karman, what is she? she? She's a Muslim Brotherhood and she is uh, an Islamic feminist, which won the Nobel Prize. What kind of a Nobel Peace Prize that an Islamic feminist should have? Because even the ideology that she have is to kill the infidel, is to cover the women, is, is to do uh, is to give the heritage of women less than the man. What kind of peace is that? And even this woman, she was in the Oprah Winfrey show, she was with Hillary Clinton, she won awards in Italy for fighting for women's rights, such a brave woman and so on. Why? Why is this is happening? Why, why not the secular women? That can... why, why do you think secularism and uh, secular women's rights activists are so key, or secular organizations like the one you've created? Why are they so important for Libya, for the Middle East? Because they are the real organization that wants to make a change. They are not telling, they are not telling the society what they want to listen. They, want, they are telling the society what they should listen and what they should think. Because we are trying to help them to think this is not right. We won't come and they didn't think that something white is black and something black is white and we would just tell them, give them whatever they want. And this is what I see the women uh, Islamist organization is working. They just give the society what they want. If I, uh, they work for women's rights according to Quran or according to uh, Sharia law, this is not a working of uh, human rights and never been. An ideology never can come with the human rights. Human rights is an uh, inequality and without dividing the religion, you can't put a religion with the human rights because you are going to destroy the human rights. Do you have hope for Libya, for change, for women's rights there? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't really feel that she, I do have hope, but not quickly. It won't, it won't uh, happen like, just like that, because it needs really long, long time. It's a long-term process, because the women themselves have to go up and speak about their rights. They have first to take their independency from the men. Economical independence, uh, uh, social independence, because still they are totally dependent on men. If How can you go out and speak about women's rights and how can you do all of these things when at the end of the day you have to go to the one, a man and ask for a money pocket from him? You, as long as they have they have this power, they will they will always be um, they will they will women always be dependent on men and they will never be able to get their rights. But once they are independent, they have their jobs, they have their lives, they have they can implement laws, they can say no, they can stop these people who interfere in their lives. What's the best way that uh, all of us can? remember the Libyan women's rights campaigner who was killed recently because in a, in a sense uh, it's an attack on all of us, all, all secularists everywhere. What's the best way we can remember her and support the women, um, secular women of Libya? I think we should never forget that secular women being killed because they fought for their, uh, for their rights and because they believed in this cause and we should never stop because we have we sacrifice people for this cause and we shouldn't stop. We have to work for secular movement uh, really strong and try to work for human rights, even in favor for those who give their lives for, for, such, a, uh, for such a cause. Thank you.
hope you enjoyed the interview with uh, Magdalene. I mean, I think in a sense, uh, when we look at her interview, we see how important, you know, the demand for really fundamental change via revolutions is for so many people, and how despite all odds, you know, being kidnapped and threatened by Islamists, uh, Salwa was, was murdered just recently, that despite that, people are continuing to fight for secularism, for equality, for freedom. I mean, people like Magdalene, they are the hope for the future of countries like Libya and everywhere else. And the, especially these, as Magdalene says, and you say yourself in the interview, they are the first ones to be targeted because they are the ones who are going to bring about a human society, a society of, you know, where people have rights, everything, against all these dark ages that groups like, you know, uh, these Islamists who are, uh, you know, on a rampage everywhere. Yeah. And, and so these are the people who should be supported. And they shouldn't feel that they're alone. They shouldn't feel that, although it's su such a sad, you know, sort of uh, tragedy that uh, Salwa was murdered in a brutal way, there are many other activists who are being br brutally murdered, but they should see themselves as part of a larger group, Definitely. a la la part, yeah. larger movement that's and, going and on. Can, can I, I just add to mm. that? I mean, really, uh, when, when I heard about Salwa's murder, it was as if one of my own comrades had been murdered. And when I spoke to Magdalene, I felt like it was one of us speaking with yeah. each other in the sense that, really, this is, goes beyond borders, in a sense. And their fight is our fight, and our fight is theirs. And I think this is an important uh, point. Uh, Magdalene and women rights activists in, in, in Middle East, they are solution to ISIS and the murderous Islamic regime. If anybody, whether in Europe or you know, in Middle East, uh, anywhere, they want to stop the Islamists, they need to support the Magdalene and women's rights activists in Iran, in Middle East, in North Africa, in Libya, you name it, in Egypt. And that, they, they, these are the solution to a society. For a human and better society, we need to support movements who actually uh, articulate women's right and because they are the ones these are the base you know and if, if you can defend the woman's right in any of those countries we'll succeed and we could change the society in Middle East and we don't have to see ISIS and Daesh and these you know murderous Islamist regimes. And, and it's interesting that uh, as it's mentioned in the interview that people like Hillary Clinton they go for the Islamic feminists you know and, and that's what it, the whole strategy was in Iraq you know was to get together people, you know, representatives of tribes and Islamic factions, put them together and, and, and say, okay, this is, they are going to run the country. And uh, this is the whole uh, point uh, there. I'm going to have to view. stop people. Yeah. And, this is, it, and this is what they do in Iran. They keep um, looking, searching for uh, moderate. There is no such thing as moderate Islamists. The only solution is actually humane, radical, the, the people, and women's rights. The, the people, and yeah. I think, I mean, this is the message really from us: is the pro-Islamist left that continues to defend Islamism? Shame on you, and you need to stop. The far right that scapegoats people who are all considered Muslims and immigrants, when so many of them have, uh, you know, uh, fought Islamists uh, at great risk to their lives. You know. That, that needs to come to an end. What we need to do is to see the huge social and political struggles that are taking place and to support them. Now, in order to make our program a little more interesting, because we don't want to be serious all the time, we're trying really hard. <laughs> Someone help us. The issues uh, are very serious. That's <laughs> the issues why. are serious, that's true. We've got the help of the fantastic Egyptian atheist, Ben Bazaziz, who was imprisoned in Kuwait for a year for his atheism. He's helping us create or um, a, a little clip every week uh, called Insane Fatwa of the Week. And of course, there are so many that it's hard to choose one. But this week's Insane Fatwa is, since we have the World Cup taking place, why not mention the Indonesian cleric who's warned that we women may be committing zina or visual fornication watching all those men wearing shorts. It's nice to know that states like the Iranian regime are so concerned about us fornicating visually that they have banned women from stadiums. Now, for all the women out there watching uh, the, the World Cup, I hope you have been enjoying, um, you know, all the visual fornication. Um, and we've, we've got, we have some nice pictures to show you of that, just in case you haven't. Before we end the program, I just wanted to thank some of the wonderful um, 126 people who supported our second fundraising campaign where we managed to raise £4,500. They are Camille R. from Canada, Claire Hershey Jr., Clara Piquirola, uh, sorry, Piquirillo, Chloe Ansari, Darren from Wokingham, David Lyons, Oxford Humanist, Jim Sumwait, Jiri Kaita, John 
Granovsky, John Servers, Mehran Sharmini, Michelle Avoyne, Mrs. Counter, Norman, and Norman Hooper. We're going to be mentioning more names in future programs. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. We've reached the end of our program. Um, we've done a lot of things that were sinful for Ramadan, from visual fornication to drinking wine. Uh, we wish all of those of you who are breaking Ramadan uh, in, across the world a, a, a happy, fast uh, resistance and yeah. breaking it when you're not allowed to break it. Okay. Bye from us. Bye.